Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we kick off a four-part series featuring special requests and guest appearances by our mysterious patrons. Our first patron is Brian, who joins us via Zoom. Greetings. Brian is a generous supporter of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, and as a thank you, we've invited him to join us for a discussion of an episode of his choosing. So, Brian, what are we listening to today? The Fisherman and His Soul from the Columbia Workshop. CBS created the Columbia Workshop in 1936 under the direction of Irving Reese. The network envisioned the series as an incubator for radio talent, a place where artists could experiment with new ideas and techniques without the creative and budgetary restrictions of a sponsor. Over the course of its initial six-year run, the series featured a who's who of radio talent, including Orson Welles, Archibald McLeish, Norman Corwin, Lucille Fletcher, William N. Robinson, Arch Obler, and Bernard Herrmann. The Fisherman and His Soul is based on a short story by Oscar Wilde, first published in his 1891 collection of fairy tales, A House of Pomegranates. It was a follow-up to The Happy Prince and Other Tales, published in 1888. Of the two, A House of Pomegranates is notably darker, using the familiar fairy tale formula to grapple with adult-oriented themes including isolation, suffering, and desire. Now let's listen to The Fisherman and His Soul from Columbia Workshop, originally aired May 7, 1938. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music and listen to the voice. <laughs> Columbia Workshop, under the direction of William N. Robeson, presents The Fisherman and His Soul by Oscar Wilde. Every evening, a young fisherman went out upon the sea and threw his nets upon the water. One evening, the net was so heavy that he could hardly draw it into the boat. And he tugged at the coarse ropes till the long veins rose up on his arms. Nearer and nearer came the circle of flat corks, and the net rose at last to the top of the water. But no fish at all was in it, nor any monster, but only a little mermaid lying fast asleep. <laughs> and now by all the fish that swim, what have I here? Come, open your eyes. Wake up. Oh, but what is this that holds me fast? Fisherman, let me go. Whatever swims into my net, that thing I keep. No. Now tell me, shall I sell you to the queen? Oh, no. <laughs> what shall I do then? Cut loose the rope and let me go. I beg you from the bottom of my heart. I did not know a mermaid had a heart. I. And tears, too, I see. Why do you cry? Because my father waits for me. And he is old and all alone. But I am young. And also all alone. And though I did not know it until now, I... I think I've been waiting for you, too. Fisherman, please. What will you give me if I let you go? Ask anything of me. I promise you shall have it. Anything? I... Well, then promise me this. That whenever I call, you'll come and sing to me. For the fish delight to hear the song of the sea folk. And when they draw near, then shall my nets be full. Will you in very truth let me go if I promise this? In very truth, I'll let you go. And then always will I come. 
when you call. And every evening from that time on, the young fisherman went out upon the sea and called to the mermaid. And she rose out of the water and sang to him. And each day the sound of her voice became sweeter to his ears. So sweet was her voice that he forgot his nets and had no care of his craft. With lips parted and eyes dim with wonder, he sat idle in his boat and listened. Closer, little mermaid, and look into my eyes. Can you not read there that I love you? In my eyes also, you may read the same. You see. But we must both forget about such things. No. Tell me why. Because you have a human soul and I have none. If only you could send your soul away, then I might love you as you wish. Is that all? Yes. It shall be done. Of what use is my soul to me? I cannot see it. I cannot touch it. I do not even know it. How can I miss that which I do not know? If you do this, then we will be together all life long under the sea. But wait. Perhaps your soul cannot be sent away. Oh. I will go to the priest and tell him how it is with you and me. I will speak about our love and beg him on my knees. And mayhap he will tell me how to send my soul away. And then you will return. Oh, I promise. And when I hear your voice across the sand, I'll come to meet you. Wait for me, my love. Wait for me. My son, do you have need of me? Give me your blessing, Father. Then let me speak. In nomine Father, the Father, the Spirit of Sancti. Amen. Amen. And now tell me what troubles you. Father, I'm in love with one of the sea folk. What? And my soul is keeping me from my desire. Tell me, how how may I send my soul away? You are mad, mad. The sea folk are already lost, and those who are traffic with them are lost also. Well, if, if they are lost, then, then let me be lost with them. For I love her. Oh. oh, tell me, Father. Does not heaven count all love? As good. No, no. Well, then, gladly I surrender heaven and find my love in my own way. My son, come back, come back. Where go you? I go to the cave at the head of the bay to speak with the red-haired one. It may be she will help me. No, no, that one is evil. She is a witch. Come back, come back. What do you like? What do you like? Fish for your net? When the wind is foul, tell me, what do you like? Yes, but you, you you're a young witch. As young as myself. <laughs> and does that frighten you? Pretty boy, what do you like? I have a little reed pipe, and when I blow on it, the fish come sailing into the bay. But it has a price. It has a price. What do you lack? Like? A storm to wreck the ships and wash the treasure chest ashore. Tell me your desire, and I will give it to you. Well, my desire is, is but for a little thing. I want to send my soul away from me. It's 
stands between me and the thing I love. Tell me, whom do you love? Well, I, I love one of the sea folk, and oh, I'd give my soul to be with her. And if I tell you how this thing is done, what will you give me in return? Oh, five pieces of gold and, and my painted boat. <laughs> oh, five pieces of gold and a painted boat. I do not need your goods. He whom I serve is richer than all the kings of this world. Yes, but then what can I give you if the price is neither gold nor silver? I... You must dance with me. Not but that? Not but that. Oh, then we will dance. Or rather, I would have paid in gold or sil silver, but... Oh, yes, you shall have the price you ask. And but... you shall have your wish. Perhaps. After we dance. <laughs> Put your arms around me. Dance. Dance. Faster. I cannot. I cannot. I promise you would pay. Tell me, am I not fair as she? I cannot think. I cannot breathe. Only think that I am here. Hold. My love is waiting. Have you known redder lips than mine? Have you known softer flesh? Your breath is hot upon my face. My I... heart beats close upon my own. Closer. Closer. Faster. Faster. What is it? Why is everything so still? I, I thought I heard somebody come, but, but who? It is he, the master, whom I serve. Oh, I see him now under this tree, but, but there's something of a king about him, yet, yet I never saw a sadder face before. I... Come, we will go to him. Yes, but what shall I say? What shall I do? You will kneel and worship him as I do. Uh, I will worship him in the only way I know. <laughs> you have done the thing that may not be done. I've only made the sign of the cross. Let me go! Let me go! No, you cannot go until you teach me how to lose my no, soul. No, I know nothing. Forget the bargain that we made. If you do not keep your promise to me, I will slay you for a false witch. Then be it so. It is your soul, not mine. Do with it as you will. Here, take this. Yes. This is nothing but a little knife. How can this serve me? Listen to me well, for it may be that I shall never see you again. What men call the shadow of the body is not a shadow. It is the body of the soul. Go down to the seashore and stand with your back to the moon. Then cut away your shadow, which lies along the sand. For in truth, it is not your shadow, but your soul. And bid it leave you, and it will do so. Is this true? It is true. And I would that I had never told you. lies along the sand. I saw. Ah, oh, one moment more and I am free. There. Oh, I have dwelt with thee all these years and have been thy servant. Send me not away from thee now. Who speaks? I am the one thou hast never seen. Never touched. Never known. And, 
And you are my soul? Aye. And what evil have I done thee that I must go? Oh, you have done me no evil, but I have no need of you. It may be so that I have need of thee. For what can I do alone? Oh, the world is wide. Go wherever you will, but, but trouble me no more. If indeed thou must drive me from me, send me not forth without a heart. The world is cruel. Give me thy heart to take with me. Oh, no, no, that I cannot do. I, I grieve to give you pain, but my heart belongs to my love. I, Should I not love also? Oh, and never let me see. No, never let me see your face from this day on. Go! Nay, nay, but we two shall meet again. Oh, how can that be? You cannot follow me to the depths of the sea. I cannot follow. That is true. But once every year I will come to this place and call to thee. It may be that thou wilt have need of me. I tell you, I shall never need you again. Never. Here. Stand here beside me and listen. Then you'll understand. Hello? Hello? I've come back to you. I've returned. What have you done? What have you done? I've sent my soul away and now I'm free. Yes, come. Yes, come. <laughs> And let us go. And never will we be apart again. Never apart. Come. And once every year, the soul came down to the shore of the sea and called to the young fisherman. And the soul tempted him with riches and with wisdom and with the wonders he had seen in the world. But always did the fisherman reply, No, no, love is better. And after the third year was over, the soul came down to the shore of the sea once more and called to the young fisherman, and he rose out of the deep, and oh, said, why, why do you call me? I beg thee, hear me out. This time I do not offer gold, nor wisdom, nor do I tempt thee from thy love. But in the north where I have been, I saw the greatest thing of all. But what is that to me? Again I tell you that I have the greatest thing of all. That may be true, but hast thou no desire to see one thing? that has been lost to thee. Come, feast thine eyes upon this sight, and then thou canst return. No. What is this thing? A dancing girl. A girl with dancing feet. A girl with dancing feet? Yes. Yes, that would be a marvel, for, for I have not seen the like in many years. Then come with me. But a day away and easy to return. Only a day? No, oh, no, I cannot. She is veiled with a veil of gauze, and naked are her feet. Little white pigeons are her feet. Little white birds that dance. A girl with dancing feet. Only a day from here, you say? Only a day. Then, then I will go with you and see this thing. For it can do no harm, and then I can return to my love. Then suffer me to enter into thee again, and be thy servant. It shall be done. It is only for a day. Come.
And his soul entered into him, and they were one, even as they were before. So they made haste, and all that night they journeyed, and all the next day, until they came to a city. But it was not the city they sought. And they came upon the street of the jewelers, and saw a fair silver cup set forth in a booth. And the fisherman's soul said to him, Take that silver cup and hide it. And he did so, saying, Why do you bid me do this thing? For it is an evil thing to do. And his soul said nothing, and they journeyed on. On the evening of the second day, they came into another city. And still it was not the city they sought. And in the street of the sandals, they saw a child standing by a jar of water. And his soul said to him, Smite that child. And he did so, saying, Why do you bid me do this thing? For it is an evil thing to do. And his soul said nothing. Then on the evening of the third day, they came upon another city. Still, it was not the city they sought. And in the marketplace, they came upon a merchant who took them to his house and gave them food and drink. And the fisherman's soul said to him, Slay this man and rob him of his purse of gold. And he did so. But when he saw the merchant lying dead, he cried aloud and said, Why did you bid me do this thing? And why did I obey? Surely you are evil. Be at peace. Be at peace. I cannot be at peace, for you have made me do these things I hate. Why do you treat me thus? I will tell thee. When thou didst send me forth into the world, thou gavest me no heart. Therefore I learned to do these evil things and love them. What do you say? Thou knowest well. Hast thou forgotten that thou gavest me no heart, although I pled with thee? I could not give my heart to you. It was my love's. And now you've tempted me away from her. Be gone, for I am done with you forever. You are an evil thing. Be gone. It is too late, for I have ended in thee. No, no, you and I are done. I'll send you away from us again, even as you went before. I'll take this magic knife and cut you from me. And never shall you enter me again. Go, go, leave me. I may not leave thee, nor canst thou drive me forth. Once in his life a man may send his soul away, but he who receiveth back his soul must keep it with him forever. And this is his punishment and reward. That's not true. I will go back to the place where my love is waiting, and I will call to her and tell her of the evil you have made me do. Then she'll understand and take me in her arms. Yes, yes, I'll go to the sea and call her. And she'll come to me. She thinks I have forgotten. It may be that she thinks I tired of her. The pleasures of the world are sweet to know. Come thou with me, and we shall find another love more fair. I want no other love. Mermaid, I've returned! There is no answer but the wind. Then, then, if she'll not come to me, here I will stay. And wait until the world shall end. Lo, I have tempted thee with good and evil, and thy love is stronger than I. For though I have returned into thy body, still is thy heart closed against me. Wherefore, I pray thee, let me enter into thy heart, and so shall we both be as we were before. Come then, for now I know that I have wronged you. For when I sent you forth without a heart, it may be that you suffered too, even as I do now. Come. Alas, I am lost. 
So burdened with love is this heart of thine, there is no room in it for me. Oh, yet I would help you if I could. I think it may be that we both are lost. Nay, call her again once more. Call her again. My love, hear me. Hear me, I pray. Give me a sign to let me know that you've not forgotten. She comes. She's heard me at last. I... Thy love returns. Thy love returns to thee upon the tide. But she is dead. My love. My love so cold in my arms. You cannot put your little hands about my neck. But I will place them there. Better than wisdom... More precious than riches, and fairer than the feet of the daughters of men. For I have looked upon evil, and looked upon good, and ever did I keep myself for you, alone. Master, I beg thee, come away. The sea is rising, and surely thou wilt drown, and I will be forever lost. Not lost. But with me, as we were before. How can that be? Oh, Master, I understand. For now thy heart has broken with its pain, and there is room for me. In the morning, the priest went forth to bless the sea, for it had been troubled. And with him went an altar boy who was wont to help him in such matters. And when they reached the shore, they saw the young fisherman lying drowned in the surf. And clasped in his arms was the body of the little mermaid. And the priest made the sign of the cross and cried aloud in anger, I will not bless the sea nor anything that is in it. Accursed be the sea folk, and accursed be all they who traffic with them. Father, I do not understand. What has he done that he should die unshriven? For love's sake, he forsook his soul, and so he lies there dead. And yet I never saw before me such peace upon a face. Stand back. You shall not look upon this evil thing. Go. Go to the marketplace and find me two strong men. And what shall I tell them, Father? Tell them to take these bodies up and bury them. Bury them in a corner of the barren field and set no mark above them. Nor any sign of any kind. How can they rest within the barren field? The place is filled with stones and nothing grows. Not even grass. There is no rest for them. Accursed were they in their lives. And accursed shall they be in their deaths also. And when three years had passed, there came a holy day. And the priest went up to the chapel that he might speak to his people and remind them of God's wrath. For the anger was still in his heart. And when he bowed himself before the altar, he saw that it was covered with strange flowers that he had never seen before. They were of a curious beauty, and their odor was sweet on the air. Beside him stood the altar boy, the same who had gone with him to the sea that day. And he began to speak to the people and remind them of God's wrath. Or if a man should send his soul away, then he himself is lost. For him there is no heaven and no hell. Forsaken by the world, he lies alone, and none shall ever know his resting place. He is one with the beasts of the field, for he put his soul away for love, and that is an evil thing. And when the day of reckoning shall come, then he will know that, he will know that if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a changing symbol. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and have not love, I am nothing. I, 
I, I cannot read the sermon I have written. From my mouth comes words that I have never said before. There is a presence in this place. A newborn sweetness in the air. Tell me, what are these flowers that stand on the altar? And where are they from? What flowers they are, we do not know. But they come, but they come from the corner of the barren field. The corner of the barren field? Oh, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I stand ashamed before thee. I have done thee a great wrong. For many years I preached thy word. But in my heart I knew it not. Not until now. But now abideth faith, hope, love. These three. And the greatest of these is love. have just heard the Columbia Workshop's presentation of The Fisherman and His Soul by Oscar Wilde. The story was adapted for radio by Hilda Lawrence, and the original orchestral score was composed by Tom Bennett. Bernard Herman conducted the orchestra, and the entire production was under the direction of William N. Robeson. The Columbia Workshop again requests your comments, criticisms, or suggestions on tonight's broadcast, and asks that you address them to the workshop in care of the Columbia Network, New York City. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was The Fisherman and His Soul from the Columbia Workshop here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was a Patreon listener request, a very special one coming to us from our Patreon, Brian, a very generous supporter of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, who is actually joining us for this podcast. Hello again, Brian. Hello. Well, Joshua, we thought we'd we try to get to know Brian a little better. Yes, and I have prepared some questions for all our Patreon guests, Brian, as well as our upcoming guests. And these are meant as kind of icebreakers and a way to better understand where you're coming from as an old-time radio enthusiast. And my first question is, if you were trapped in a lighthouse with nothing but rats for company and a single old-time radio series to listen to over and over again, <laughs> what would it be and why? <laughs> okay, I have a proviso first, and that is that I'm not going anywhere near a lighthouse without an ample <laughs> supply of Roma wine, uh, which I would, I would share with the rats. Uh, <laughs> but my choice of a radio show would have to be, for obvious reasons, expense. I mean, it's got the variety, it's got the number of episodes, it's got the quality, and I cannot listen to suspense, I kid you not, without the availability of wine, because those commercials <laughs> are so effective. All right. On the total other end of the spectrum, if you were an angry, fickle god, what old-time radio show would you wipe from existence? I am an angry, fickle god, so any, <laughs> any radio show that offended me, you've never heard of, because I wiped it from existence before <laughs> your uh, awareness of it would have forgotten. Well, thank you, because I can't remember Dark Fantasy anymore, so thank you. <laughs> oh, it wouldn't be Dark Fantasy, I'm afraid. It would be uh, shows a little nearer to your heart, because if I had my way, there would be nothing hard-boiled except eggs. Ah. Wow. <laughs> but see, that was pretty hard-boiled, the way you said that. So, <laughs> Gotcha. It really, really was. <laughs> Uh, so I have to ask as a patron and other people listening might be interested in this. Why on earth do you give your hard earned money to this ridiculous podcast? Well, I'm a civil servant. So you're under a double misapprehension. Uh, you think I earn money and you, you think I, I earn it. Um, 
<laughs> I would like to say what I've said to so many people that during the pandemic, uh, I think I'm lucky to be, you know, to have a job that hasn't affected. So I think just as during World War II, war profiteering was morally objectionable. I think anyone who comes out of this with more money than they went in just because there's nothing to spend it on is morally the equivalent of a war profiteer. So I think it's incumbent upon each of us to uh, support the arts. I'd like to say that, but in your case, uh, you're the one <laughs> entertainment that I supported before the pandemic began, just narrowly. You're doing something worthwhile, and I'm here to support it. Thank you. We do appreciate it. Uh, and finally, this is your opportunity, if you have one, any burning question that you want to put to us, and we are forced to answer it. Yeah, it has to do with your modus operandi here. Um, you try to determine whether radio shows stood the test of time. And with the world the way it is, do you really think that's a worthwhile means of evaluating them? I mean, you know, as Wilde, our author tonight, said in one of his plays, uh, I'd be sorry to, to be on the same level as a world such as this or an age such as this. <laughs> so do you think standing the test of time I, is really something to aim for? I will uh, address that question a little bit there because I feel like I wanted to make that the central question in a really loosey-goosey way as a way to invite people who might only know old-time radio as an old-fashioned thing Right. To let them know that that's a valid point of view. We'd still like to listen with, with an open mind, but we don't reject people who don't know this or might just offhand think that this is an old-fashioned thing and why it was having a value today. You're very yeah, open-minded that way. I'll <laughs> jump right exactly with what Tim said. Standing the test of time means for me that I could hand that episode over to someone with no previous knowledge or even like of it and they would say hey that was pretty good and it's just a cheap way to structure our podcast <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> sing <laughs> but that's a great question yeah well thanks brian now we're gonna change it thanks <laughs> <laughs> well and an astute transition into today's actual content but with the oscar wilde thing yes right? you should have your own podcast brian <laughs> you know people say and that and I have a long list of challenges out there, uh, and my dueling pistols are primed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should just start with that. Brian, why uh, did you pick this episode when you were given the opportunity to bring one to the podcast and appear with us and talk about it with us? Because it is definitely outside, not entirely, I could make arguments, but somewhat outside of the type of story we usually discuss on this podcast. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that it was originally aired on my mother's seventh birthday, which was <laughs> which was a temptation. She's she's not among us anymore, but and she wouldn't have listened to it in the first place. So I asked her many years ago about her experience of old time radio, and and she said, you know, in rural America, it was a luxury that you did not turn on the radio unless it was for a special event you knew about in advance and you were willing to expend the precious battery life on. I also did a lot of work on Wild in graduate school and I decided to investigate what old time radio shows had covered his work and The Fisherman of His Soul was uh, one of them that I thought was worthwhile and I thought none of you would probably like and so it would be fruitful for discussion. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that you uh, are educated in the ways of wild, because I think when we get into this, uh, I have a couple questions about the story that you might be able to, to answer, maybe have a clearer idea of authorial intent. But I feel like there are two ways to discuss this, which is wild story and the production itself. And maybe we start with, because I think it's the harder one to tackle is the actual story. Yeah, I think that's easier. Okay, great. See, we're we're fighting already. <laughs> <laughs> I have no knowledge of, of course, the original story. 
or know anything about Oscar Wilde. So all I can tell you is, as someone who likes old-time radio and radio drama, what I thought of this story. And my guess is that the story itself isn't as straightforward as, as I took it. Guy needs to get rid of his soul to be with the mermaid. And how do you do that? Well, got to go through a couple things. I'm guessing it's layered in uh, all sorts of metaphors for society and uh, how we live our lives and things that aren't as straightforward as that. So what are the layers to this? Brian is as an Oscar Wilde aficionado. Well, I think you're right. It is impossible to separate Wilde's life from his work. One interesting thing about it is in 1889, the publisher of Lippincott's magazine invited two people to dinner, and they were Oscar Wilde and another budding author by the name of Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm. And he asked them each to come up with a story for an issue of Lippincott. And the story Wilde offered him was this one. The story Conan Doyle offered him or wrote for it, rather, was uh, the second Sherlock Holmes novel, Sign of Four. This is not the story that Wilde wound up providing Weapon Cops. He wrote a new story for it called The Picture of Dorian Gray. But you ask about the, the layers of society. I think it's easier to say the allegorical elements in the story are the soul, which I think for Wilde represents moral choice, the heart, which he separates from the soul. And this is really grasping for things, but I think it's, it's tenable. The feet. Yeah. The feet are where, yeah. where the, the soul is attached to the body, and they represent moral progress, I think. Uh, I was viewing it in terms of this is a character who is trying to make his way, being in love with a thing that society in general considers a beast, or this is unnatural love. Yes, uh, I think that's a very appropriate context to take it in. Yes, I think that obviously it's hard not to interpret it that way. I also think it's interesting that this was the story he originally offered and came up with a picture of Dorian Gray instead, because they both are stories of, to some degree, of the soul being separated from the body. The, I mean, the fisherman ultimately suffers because of his divorcing himself from his soul. And it's only through the reuniting of the fisherman with his heart and his soul and his love that redemption is achieved through sacrifice. Or is it? I mean, things are never that straightforward in while. Part of the story that's left out of the radio broadcast is that sure you have these beautiful miraculous flowers that change the mind of the priest but you're left with the information that the flowers that miraculously bloom in the corner of the barren field never bloom again mm. so is it all uh, well hearts and flowers the biggest thing they miss in the radio adaptation and i think it's the biggest fault for me of the adaptation is the soul's sojourn to find both knowledge and power or wisdom and power. They brush over that really fast. They, the narrator says that uh, the fisherman was offered riches as well as wisdom and turned it down. But when we don't see the soul's experience and when we don't actually hear the fisherman turn them down, it seems like he is convinced rather quickly to run away from the mermaid. Uh, whereas in the story we see how much effort on the soul's part it took to come up with the correct temptation for the fishermen. I was really surprised at how well they did with cutting down on the narration because there is so much description in Wild. So I think that part of getting rid of those two major episodes, this was a 30,000-word story originally. Getting rid of those two episodes is uh, a production choice to get rid of a lot of of top-heavy narration. The other thing is that one of the things Wilde got criticized for was he does have this incredibly sensual style that makes things so attractive. And he took a lot of heat for 
for making sensuality attractive. And I'm not sure how well that would have gone in the 1930s. Although this was not a sponsored show. This was a sustaining show, so you didn't necessarily need to worry about what the sponsors would think about your morality. And I assume Columbia Workshop, the idea was like, we do literary stuff. This is a piece of literature. So it's, it, being selected at all kind of right. gives it a wash of respectability. Production-wise, was the Fisherman and the Soul, I couldn't tell, is it the same voice or not? I thought it was two different actors. I guess I, I thought so as well. Yeah, okay. me too. Yeah, okay, I thought it was different. I found nothing on the cast in all my research. So the idea, production-wise, directorially, if I'm going to have an actor talking to a soul, it's going to be the same actor. Uh, slightly different voice, uh, some kind of modification. But the idea that it was such a separate entity from him. I think the, the choice really does establish, like, this use of the word soul is not so much meant to be your true self. Uh, and this might be why they chose to do it, but strictly... This is your personal sense of morality, just, you know, a tiny sliver of your personality. Right. Yeah, I think they wanted to emphasize that they were the same but separate. But it was two separate actors. We don't know. It sounded like it, but well, there is very little information on who this I cast see. was, who the singer was. Right. All sorts of stuff that would be interesting to know. And maybe some uh, bigger old-time radio geeks out there would be able to recognize the voices and uh, email us a- later and tell us. It's not a big deal. It's just from my standpoint, I would have opted to make it a caricature of that human. Do you know what I'm saying? Some kind of extension. Yeah, that choice really does have implications about what they're saying. Well, yeah. And I hear what you're saying. If they're saying something else, then I'm wrong. And well, you know, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one who frames it as right and wrong. It's just you're two right. different takes on it. You're right. It is me. I'm wrong. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you did it again. <laughs> um, I think there's also a lesson to be learned about falling in love with something that comes from the water that quick and deciding that um, <laughs> these are your choices. You're going to make that quickly and go live with it. And I think we also well, look at you like the priest calling it it. Yeah. It, well, yeah, yeah, you're so small minded, Eric. Listen, I know you don't like seafood, so you're like really grossed out. (laughs) Three years before he went, you saw something with feet, huh? (laughs) What what did those look like? I miss feet. Uh, And of course, that's very practical. I get that everything's a allegory or metaphor, but I don't think it's all allegorical. I think he is tempting him with something he hasn't had in a while. It right. is the pursuit of fleshly desire there, I think, that takes him out of the water because he's tired of mermaid. <laughs> I mean, but well, he, I was interested in the uh, the nuance of the allegory of when he first meets her, like, hey, great, this will catch me a lot of fish. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And he's kind of being cruel. Yeah. He questions things about the mermaid, like the, that she's equal in any way. He's like, I didn't know mermaids had hearts. Or tears. That's such a cruel line. <laughs> oh, look, it's crying. <laughs> <laughs> it thinks it's people. <laughs> so he has a similar outlook. It's good to know also that your local priest doesn't have a really quick way for you to separate your soul. Something. I don't know. He just said he wasn't going to help. I mean, he may have had, like, I know how to do this. But... <laughs> Uh, well, so, I actually enjoy the naivete of the fisherman in that moment where he's like, yeah, baby, I'll just go to the priest and he'll rip out my soul so I can hook up with a fish lady. I'm sure there's not any sort of theological issues there. I, <laughs> right. He, I'll be right back. He's, he was so convinced that that would be an easy thing. Um, the and dance. Then later with the witch, yeah, of like... You'll have to dance with me. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. What is? You'll have to worship. Okay. What is the representation? <laughs> why does the witch need to be danced with? Is this a dumb question? But why does she need that? Why is that a reward for her? I, I think that that's part of the whole grasping at straws, feet and moral choice thing. 
that I think dancing is symbolic of actual moral progress. Motion of the, I mean, this is silly, but motion of the feet is actually moral motion in this story. And mm. it's the dancing with the witch that represents the most direct threat to the, to the fisherman's soul, just as it's the temptation of a dancing girl that lures them away from the club that causes his reunion with his soul. His physical motion through the landscape is moral motion. Uh, right. That's how I read the thing. I poked my oh. nose into some synopses of the, the story. I don't know if it's directly from there, if it's the synopsis kind of interpretation, but to she wanted her to dance with her at the devil's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It was specifically dance with me to summon the devil. Aha. I didn't catch that, so that makes sense. I don't think it's in the adaptation, I think. Ah. I mean, the devil well, shows the up king. here. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's obviously sexual, though, too, as the temptation with the woman with the dancing feet is to get him out of the water. And so I do think it is meant to imply that sort of bacchanalia type of ceremonial mm -hmm. paganism particularly in the context of, as Brian said, the next temptation being in the form of another dancing woman. With feet like pigeons. And he's writing Salome at the same time, where Salome has feet like little doves. There's the idea of forbidden love that we talked about at the beginning of this. I think it's interesting that there was a reckoning of sorts for the priest of his decision of what you're doing is wrong and bad and you are cursed and accursed and both of you can't be buried and blah 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 and then realizing oh my god what have i done these are, love is love right well and also yeah, I, that the the compensation the end is not and they were revived in the tap ever after it was just that they were blessed they were acknowledged yeah. and the stigma was taken away right and you've got to think about what was going on, I mean, if you're going to make the authorial fallacy, the intentional fallacy anyway, which you have to with Wilde, you got to think about what's going on in his life and his heart right at this point where he's been recently seduced by Robbie Ross and he's you know, fascinated with this new lifestyle. But on the other hand, he knows what he's doing to his wife and children. You know, it's not a simple love is love moral choice for him. And, and I, think, I think most of the story really portrays that well. I think it's a really fascinating story with a lot of disparate threads. What I don't like about it is the ending. I, I feel like he takes all these threads and instead of carefully tying them together by hand, slaps a store-bought bow on them. <laughs> I feel like it's so weird when the priest has that transformative moment, but really, from a story point of view, the story proves the priest more right than wrong on many turns, which I think makes it, as you said, a more complex story. Like, uh, I should be able to do this, but if I do that, then this bad thing happens. But I feel like they sweep aside the fact that the priest was absolutely right in that separating from his soul resulted in three deaths. He warned him about the witch. Um, he literally you know, made a deal with Satan. <laughs> and again, this all goes to make the story more complex, but I think the ending is a little too neat for me, other than, as Brian pointed out, in the actual story, you have that idea that this isn't a permanent change. This was a, a blessing that happened in this moment due to uh, some transformative experience of the priests, and those flowers didn't grow again. Well, and weirdly, he didn't make a deal with the devil. He messed it all up, and he just held the witch hostage long enough for her to tell him. Yeah, I mean, but he was going to, as you pointed out earlier, Tim, like, yes. okay. <laughs> he was, he was right. like, yes. worship him. Okay, he just did it wrong and somehow survived it by threatening to kill the witch. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, well, not, think... he's not a very likable fellow, uh, I don't think, throughout all of this. Um, yeah, that's true. It, which I think makes it a more interesting story. And, and um, I don't know anywhere near as much about Oscar Wilde as Brian does. But I feel as I'm reading this, someone, as he described, who's torn throughout. Um, and so it, it might have been his attempt to play with the fairy tale structure and open up all these questions and then make you a little uncomfortable by giving it a fairy tale ending. When the 
rest of it did not have the simplicity of a fairy tale. I don't know if, if Brian has more insight into this, but it, it echoes to me like Arabian Nights stories, the Thousand One Tales of the Arabian Nights, more so than like a European fairy tale, just in the strange twists and turns that are taken so more or less casually. Particularly the original, because the other journeys that the soul takes, they're long and detailed and really beautifully written, but almost perplexing in their detail because they are ultimately unimportant. They're all journeys that fail to achieve what the soul wants. And one thing I think it's important, it's what Richard Elman in 1987 won the Pulitzer for, for his biography of Wilde, or at least the only thing of value I found in the book was his realization that with Wilde, you have to set moral simplicity aside and be able to adopt simultaneously opposed views on everything. Mm -hmm. I think that was the realization Elman came to in 1987. And I have been away from scholarship for 30 years, but I find that is what is being preached in the pulpits of Oxford to this day is that with Wilde, there is no simple conclusion, even in a fairy tale, mm -hmm. that you have to be able to say the fisherman is both damned and saved at the same time or goes beyond the state of damnation or salvation. Uh, has anybody got anything else they want to add to this before we send it to the vote? The only thing I wanted to bring up are a couple production-specific uh, notes about this, and that is the inclusion of the song, which I think is really interesting. There was a moment where I thought they were going to skip over that because the story obviously describes the song, but it's like, this is a radio drama. I hope we hear it. Ultimately, I don't, I, the song didn't work as well for me, I think because I'd read the story and I imagined the song to have more of an otherworldly quality to it. Because I'm a nerd of the 80s, I thought of like Julie Cruz during her Twin Peaks period <laughs> for like the sound quality <laughs> I had in my head, which is obviously totally unfair to uh, a 1938 production on, on the radio. Uh, but I was really glad they went to the extra effort to include it. I also, the first time through, did not like the dance music they used for that witch's dance. It felt a little just off to me. And then the second time I heard it, I really liked it for the exact same reason I didn't like it the first time. Because <laughs> right. it, it is, it's weirdly cartoony and jarring. It is just one of those examples of sometimes your first listen uh, isn't your best. Yeah, I had assumed that the two musical pieces were largely what we'd talk about. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, in what minuscule amount of information I, I was able to glean about this production, it just, I got the impression that, that the musical compositions were what it was focused on experimenting with. And I also, on first listen, did not like either of them. And I, the, the dance grew on me after multiple hearings, partly because of the way it was incorporated with the dial. Mm -hmm. I thought it was effective. And I also, I don't know if you've ever seen the Nazim of a film of Salome, but I tried to picture that sort of aesthetic, that highly stylized aesthetic, and I found that the dance number worked better with that in mind. Let's throw this to our final judgy, voting judgy stuff. I'll just start it because I'm on the outside looking in in a lot of ways. I don't know anything about Oscar Wilde, and I don't know anything about this story. And the only way I can tell you what I think of it is, well, how did the story work? Um, I thought everything was just fine. Uh, it didn't really bother me. Here's what I took away from it, though. And I will say that about 10 minutes in, when that I don't know anything about a song being the original story. All I know now is, ah, uh, someone's singing. Okay, there's a song. It's a musical. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know that that's part of the original stories. I'm like, oh, we're breaking into song. Okay. So I had to hang tight because I was like, ah, I, this is really not anything I'm going to enjoy. However, by the end, the story itself is kind of cool. For example, I think the concept of you being able to 
uh, knife out physically your own soul and get rid of it is a really cool concept that I'm going to steal someday. <laughs> oh, you're going to cut your soul off? No, yes. No. After dancing with a witch. Yeah. If that ever comes up, I'm doing it. I, I like that as a horror piece that you could rip your own soul out and have a conversation with your own soul is really a cool concept. I think, though, that my opinion is really inconsequential because uh, I'm just so out of my league on this. But overall, it was okay. And I think Joshua and Tim knowing me, I think that th- th- you're probably shocked that I thought it was okay. I, uh, I was counting on you to hate it. I, I did when she <laughs> you started let me singing. Down. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, when she started singing, I'm being as nice as I can. I went, oh, God, no, it's a musical. <laughs> but uh, I did find the dance and the talk with Satan. Uh, I found a lot of it kind of ooky. So uh, I'll give it an okay. Tim? Uh, yes. I will not call it a classic, but um, this is an excellent radio series doing an excellent ad- adaptation of an excellent story. Um, if anything is outdated about this production, it's just that it's an old story. Um, but the adaptation itself, I think, is very good. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think this is another example, and we've listened to other CBS uh, radio workshops, or Columbia, excuse me, CBS is the later one, Columbia workshops. Um, it's another example of just how innovative and, I think, daring they were for 1938. I, I doubt this story and some of the sentiments were crowd-pleasing in 1938, and perhaps for different reasons, it wasn't entirely crowd-pleasing here on our podcast in 2021, which means uh, it's still challenging and it still uh, really stands the test of time. I would not call it a classic. I have some adaptation issues with it, mainly that loss of those other travels by the uh, soul, as I mentioned. I I do want to say my last observation, which I found funny, and perhaps it wasn't true uh, in the 1880s when this was written, but the priest, when he starts spontaneously speaking from uh, Corinthians chapter 13, says these are words either he's never seen or I think never spoken, which I immediately thought, this guy's never officiated a wedding ever, because <laughs> <laughs> this is the love verse that is used in every yep. single wedding you've yep. ever been to. Um, but maybe it was not so cliche uh, when Wilde wrote it. This, this priest only preaches on the wrath of God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brian, what do you think of this? I get a vote. Do I have to register on, on voting day? All, I, I think it's irrelevant whether it stands the test of time. I, I like it. I like particularly the stylized performances of the soul and the witch and the priest to some yeah. extent. Less so do I like the, the fisherman and the mermaid, but the stylized performances appeal to me. Um, no, it's not a classic. The story may be, the, the show is not. All right. Well, hey, then, Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com, home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes there. You can leave messages. You can vote in polls. Let us know what you think. You can send us messages. You can send us requests. You can link to our social media pages, our Threadless store, and buy swag. Or you, like Brian, can check out our Patreon page. Yes, go to patreon.com slash the morals and you too can become a Brian. Who knows? You you might even end up on the podcast. And if you'd like to see us performing live, we do adaptations and recreations of old-time radio shows on a lot of our own original work, doing radio dramas live on stage. Come see the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society. We perform monthly. You want to know where we're at? Uh, and uh, what we're doing, just go to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousoldradiolisteningsociety.com to see the shows that we're doing and to how to get tickets. And we do shows, once again, monthly. Been doing them a long time. We'll be somewhere. Unless you found this on the Internet in 2089, and um, we're probably not doing them anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, once again... Brian, thank you so much for being here. Quite welcome. That was fantastic, and I learned something about Oscar Wilde. Look at that. It's a, it's a banner day. It's like, it's like <laughs> I was in college. What's coming up next? Next, uh, we will be featuring another Patreon pick. This one from Tim. It'll be an episode of Escape entitled Four Went Home. Until then... Look out! 
Uh, Which of you poor suckers has to edit that? (laughs) (laughs) If you'll take my advice, you'll find the corner of the barren field and just bury it. <laughs> hey, but then what? I got to deal with all the flowers that are going to grow all over it. Oh, it's I really wouldn't bad. shout on that. 